All right, make some noise if you're excited to be in God's house. Come on, guys. All right. We are in week two of a series where we're going verse by verse through verse 1 John. It's a book, a small book, five chapters in the New Testament. Um, if you missed last week, you should go check that out because we kind of set the stage for what this book is all about, the context and the purpose of it. So that's an important message for you to go check out at some time, hopefully even later today or later this week. John is writing this gospel. This is the apostle John, and he's um, an elder now. He's probably around 80 years old. He's writing a letter to the church, to the followers of Jesus or this Jesus movement that is still new, but is now in its second, third generation. And John's noticing some things within the church, some challenges coming from within the church that they're starting to drift away from some important principles, maybe even some important doctrine and teachings that he thought was so imperative that he would write a strong letter. And so John is, he's called a son of thunder, him and, him and James. They're sons of thunder. So his personality is very thunderous. It's very forward. It's very direct. And so we're going to get a taste of that today. So, so if you have a problem with the message, take it up with Papa John, okay? It's just, it's, it's John, the elder who's who's going to come at us and challenge us quite a bit today. So I told you last week, that the big idea, like the reason why John wrote this letter was uh, to show us like what true saving faith look like. Like what is that? What is true saving faith look like? First John chapter 5, 13, in the end of his letter, he tells us kind of the whole reason why. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. So that's why he's writing. He's writing so that we would know what true saving faith looks like. And throughout the letter, he gives us different tests, some tests that you can really see like, hey, if you are walking in, in, in faith or someone claims to walk in the faith, here are the tests. And we're actually going to get into three of those today. We're going to look at three of the tests of what it means to be a follower of Christ. But the reason why he's answering this question is because at this point in the Jesus movement, there's now... Um, some false teachers that are coming from within the body of Christ, and they're leading some of the believers away from what John knew to be solid and true that Jesus is. They were teaching that Jesus was not God in the flesh, and here John comes and corrects that thing. He says, no, 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 he, he was in the beginning with God, was with God and is God. He is the word of life, the light of mankind. And so he's re-correcting not only who Jesus is, but but there were these false teachers that had a very casual and compromising approach to sin and the lifestyle that God has called us to live. In this next section that we're going to study today, we're going to conclude 1 John chapter 1 and tap in a little bit to 1 John chapter 2. He mentions the word sin nine times, and he contrasts it with light and darkness. Now, I know some of you are already thinking like, uh-oh, it's a sin message coming at me. Hold up now, okay, you guys. I just, it's sin's not what you like probably think it is. It's not a religious term. It, it means, it's an archery term. That's where it's taken from. It means to miss the mark, okay? And this is, this is yeah, he's going he's gonna to get in our business and draw some, draw some lines in the sand for us. But this is one of the benefits of reading your Bible verse by verse, okay? That you don't get to pass over challenging parts of the word that convict you, that make you, you know, have to address some things in your, in your own life. Some of you have been in, a prover, in Proverbs for too long. Your, your verse a day Christianity ain't going to cut it for long. Okay, so, so taking a, a verse by verse approach is going to cause us to look directly at some of the teaching of God's word and deal with it and allow it to deal with us. And yeah, it's going to challenge us. Light versus darkness. Another contrast he makes is, is uh, saying and doing. We're going to, you know, because Christianity, faith is not just a matter of talk. It, it, it's a, it's a, we must also walk or live what we believe. And throughout the New Testament, uh, this, this faith journey has been, you know, compared to this walk because walking is progressive. There is progress to your faith. In Galatians chapter 5, the Apostle Paul says that if we walk in the Spirit, we'll not gratify the desires of the flesh. 
So the title of today's message, what John the Elder Apostle, he's going to help us with today, is how to learn this. How do we walk in the light? How do we walk in the light? Just as a child has got to learn and grow up and learn how to walk in life, they gotta, they're going to stumble, they're going to fall, they're going to have to pick themselves up. So a true follower of Jesus has to learn how to walk in the light. And yes, absolutely, there's going to be stumbling and falling and picking yourself back up. But the greatest hindrance that John is going to meet head on today with walking in the light is dark. It's darkness, the lure of dark. And John doesn't waste any time. He calls it what it is. Sin draws us out of the light and into the dark. I want to remind us, though, that as followers of Christ, we'll never be without sin. Okay? No, you will never be perfect. On this, I said this last week, but Christians on this earth will never be sinless, but as we walk out our faith, we will sin less. Okay? So 1 John chapter 2, verse 1 says it like this. This is John. He says, my dear children, and he's, again, he's, he's elder, man. This is like everyone's a child to him. He's, he's a, an older man going, hey, my dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. He's going, man, you don't need to live that way. There's, there's something more that he's going to show us that we can actually walk into, but if anybody does sin, like you ain't perfect, if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father. It's Jesus Christ, the righteous one. And this word advocate, when you look up that word in the Greek, which is what your New Testament was written in, it's, it's the word paraclete or parakletos, and you may be familiar with that word. It's used a lot of the Holy Spirit. It means to come alongside someone. To come along, that's what Jesus does. It's used in, in, in courtrooms a lot, that, that if you were called into court to testify or something, you would take an advocate with you, a lawyer with you, and they would plead on your behalf. They would come alongside you and plead on your behalf. Now, everyone in here, you're on, you're on a spectrum of how you approach sin and what you think about sin. There's a different spectrum all over this room. Some of you are way over here, and you just, you know, you don't... You're like, grace, mercy, everybody sinned, it's all good. You know what I mean? I'm not under that stuff. And like maybe, maybe yes, grace and mercy, praise God for that. But maybe you just don't give it the attention that it actually needs. And, and, and so there's a, there's a level of compromise over here. And then there's others of you over here that are so rigid and legalistic. And, and, and by the way, the, you're not, you hate sin, but you don't, you don't hate sin in you. You hate sin in everybody else. And that's what this camp is over here. You know what I mean? It's not, there's not like a, a rep, repentant attitude. There's, there's actually a very negative and critical judgmental focus that you have on other people's lives. And so within faith and your journey of spirituality, there probably is a wide variety of those extremes of where you fall within there. But John, this apostle, this elder, is going to show us the different approaches, the three in this, in 1 John chapter 1, he gives us three approaches that we can take towards sin. And we're going to, you fall in probably one of these camps, and I'm encouraging you to, to actually find yourself in the last one, but every one of us do. There's three approaches to sin that we can have. Take some notes with me, write this down, you guys. Number one is this. That we can try to cover our sins, John says. This is one approach you can have. You can just hide it, act like it's not there. You know how you cover your sins? We lie. We lie. That's what we do. And, and, and we'll put on, we put on a mask to project something that we are not to make other people think we're spiritual or we're more mature or we're good or everything's okay in my home or whatever that is. It's just like this, it's, it's, it's a lie. We want other people to see us a certain way, so we begin to, to lie to other people by covering our sins. And here's the challenge with that. And I'm not saying everybody needs to know all your business. That's not what I'm saying. Someone needs to know. I mean, not everybody, but there are some people that should know what's going on in your home, what's going on in your heart, what's going on in your mind, what's going on in your marriage. Here's the challenge when you cover it up and you wear that mask for too long. You forget you're wearing a mask. And the mask becomes you you don't even know what you look like behind the mask anymore to the point where you're not, just, you're not lying to other people, you're lying to yourself. And that's that second, and John, I'll show them to you guys as John points this out. You lie to others, you can lie to yourself. And if you continue that third stage of deception and lying that we get, eventually get to is, is where we just call God a liar. We say, no way, man, I'm not a, no, and you project your, your deception 
on him and what he says about it. So let's look at it together. First John chapter, I know I'm not going to get a lot of amens with this one. I know, I know. But it's just, I'm going to let the, I got so much scripture. I'm just going to let the word of God hopefully preach for itself and stuff. There's a lot of scriptures I have. Couldn't even fit in all your notes, man. But let's go. First John chapter one, verse five. It says, this is the message that we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light and in him, there's no darkness at all. Now, if we claim to have fellowship with him, Yet walk in the darkness. We lie. He said, you're covering it up. You're covering up sin to make other people think that you're something that you're not. And we do not live in the truth. Verse 10 says, if we claim that we have not sinned, we're calling God a liar. So so not only do we call God a liar, but look at this. His word is not in us. So we apply God's word to others, but not to ourselves. We'll sit in church services or in small groups where we're not touched by the word. It's not in us. This is why you can hear a message but not be changed by the message. Why? Because the word of God, the word of God that is light, that is power, cannot transform who you're pretending to be. It can't get through the, the facade that you're, that you're putting up. So we hear the word, but you're, it's not manifested in you, and there's no fruit from it. He says, oh, you're a liar, and the word isn't in you. The light of the word isn't in us. Peter says that we are called out of darkness into his marvelous light. And light is powerful. Light produces life. Light produces growth. Light produces beauty. But sin is darkness, and darkness and light cannot exist together in the same time, in the same space. It can't. Now, if we're walking in the light, check this out, the darkness has to go. Okay, this is... This is the secret to what John is telling us to victory here. It's not that you focus on the darkness and try to work on it. The key is walking in light, and the darkness has to go. If you hold on to the sin, the light has to go. See, with John, again, there's no middle ground, right? There's not the gray area for us to vaguely exist in, especially when when it comes to sin. No, there's light, and there's darkness, and that that you're holding on to, that sin, casts out the light. When light shines on us, you know what it does? It reveals our true nature. It reveals what's really going on inside of us. John chapter 3, verse 20 says it like this. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light. Why? For fear that all of our deeds will actually be exposed. Oh, no, you'll see what's going on. So you know what I need to do? So, so God doesn't see it, and so people don't see it, and so they don't judge me or think of me. Or you know what I need to do? I act like everything's okay. Everything's fine. Blessed. Amen. Amen. Everything's good. We're good. Okay? This is, this is John is saying, hey, here's an approach that some of you are taking to the sin. You're taking it light. You're trying to cover it up. The second approach, he tells us, is that we can actually confess our sin. We can confess our sin. Now, he calls Jesus the advocate. I told you last week that that the enemy is called the accuser. Revelation chapter 12, by the way, he's called the accuser of the brethren. Then we have the advocate. These are like judicial legal terms. When coupled with confession, uh, this is why this might be hard for some of us to come to this place of confession and treat the sin in our life this way, is because in our system, in our legal system, it's confession is usually followed by sentencing. Uh, it's time. You, I confess. Do you know what I mean? And that's why lawyers, advocates, and lawyers in our system try to cover it up. <laughs> Act like, you know, it's, you know, shift attention and divert attention, like, like get them off the hook, okay? But that's not, that's, according to our system, that's what happens, but not the kingdom of heaven system. Confession doesn't get you in trouble, confession gets you redemption. So let's look at it. First John chapter 1, verse 7. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, that's his key theme here, is walking in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. Verse 8, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves. That's where we've come to now. not just lying to others, now I'm lying to myself, and the truth is not in me. Verse 9, but if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Now this word confess does not just mean admitting the wrong that we did. The word confess actually means to say the same thing about. 
So when you're confessing, what you're doing is you're saying the same thing about that that God says. God, I'm going to come into agreement about how, what you say about that in my life. I confess. That's what it is. I had this guy years ago come up to me and tell me like some of his struggles was going on. He's, he loved Jesus, been trying hard, but been dealing with a, this a sin kept coming up in his life and coming up in his life. And it was very cyclical for him. And I told him this verse, verse John chapter 1, verse 9. I said, bro, here's the promise of God. If you confess your sin, he is faithful and just. will forgive you of all your sin. He'll purify you. And then what you need to do is trust that forgiveness and walk out of his power. So I said, hey, I'm going to agree with you, but you pray, man. You confess that thing right now. And you activate that word in your life. And so I grab his hands and he goes, Oh, Lord, Father in heaven, you know, all like spiritual and stuff. Oh, Lord, Father in heaven, if we have anything in our heart against you, and I let go of his hands, I say, hold on, bro. Hold on. There ain't no if here. You just told me some stuff, and we're no if here. And, and I appreciate you praying for me, but this ain't we time. This ain't we time. You need to humble yourself and come into agreement about what you just said and what God says about what you're dealing with. So that's what confession is. Confession is naming it, what God calling it, what calls on. If, call it envy if it's envy, hate if it's hate, gossip or manipulation or lust or deceit. You call it, see, confession is, is humbling yourself and being honest with yourself. It's being honest with God. And it's being honest maybe with other people. If they're involved, be honest with them too. It's more than just admitting sin. Check this out. It's judging sin. It's making a judgment. I know that's a word that is not in, we don't like, to, but that's, this is what literally we're doing. To confess the sin, we're coming into agreement of the judgment of God on it. This is what God says is sin and is not for me, and I come into agreement with you, God. This is wrong. This is bad. This is unhealthy. This is toxic. This is what it is. I judge the sin according to your judgment on it in my life. I confess. Okay? And so John says, look, this is, this is how you can approach sin, man. This, is, this matters. Light and darkness cannot exist. You can continue to cover it and live in the darkness, man. Or you can step out into the light. You're not going to get judged for that. You're going to get redeemed. You're going to get free when you confess that. But then there's a whole other level that he says, hey, this is available to you to approach sin this way. Write it down. It's, it's, he says we can actually conquer our sin. We can conquer our sin. Proverbs 28 and 13 tells us, whoever conceals their sins, whoever covers them, does not prosper. But he who confesses, look what it says, and renounces them finds mercy. See, there is in Christ, as you walk in the Spirit, John calls it walking in the light. Earlier this year, I talked to you about the renewing of your mind. When you walk in the renewing of your mind, when you walk in the Spirit, when you walk in the light, you have so much more access to the kingdom of heaven, to the power of God, to the authority over every dominion, over every principality, over every enemy, over every sin that you don't realize that there's a whole nother dimension of authority and victory that you have access to, that you can conquer your sin. These next two verses in 1 John chapter 2, in the, nowhere in the New Testament it, are there two verses like this that are as clear and concise about the work of Jesus. I could do a whole message on just these two verses alone. These are powerful. John uses two words to describe Jesus. We've explained one of them, and I'm explaining the other one. The first one was advocate. Okay, let me show you what John, he, he, he now clarifies a little bit more about what Jesus has done and who he is. First John chapter 2, let's read verse 1 again. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin, but if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father. It's Jesus Christ, the righteous one. Verse 2. He is, look what it says, the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Now, some of your translations, your Bibles, may still, still have the word there, propitiation. I know it's a theological word, it, 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 and they, they translated it rightly here in the NIV. It, it, it is an atoning sacrifice, and I think that it's harder for us to understand the atonement of Christ, the propitiation of Christ, harder than it is to understand that he's our advocate, because we still have advocates today. We have judicial system, legal system. We, we got that, so we kind of understand that part, but I think that 
we're too far removed from some of the stuff in the Bible that it's hard for us to understand. Like, I think we're too far removed from the farm. <laughs> There's a lot of farming analogies in the Bible, and like, that we kind of can't fully grasp the, the principles of harvest and sowing and reaping that are, that are there if, if we're too far removed from the farm and the principles of the farm. I think we're too far removed from the blood. And we don't understand the power of the blood, the why of a sacrifice. And, and, and the tragedy is, this is the gospel. This is the whole reason why Jesus had to come, did come, and died on the cross for every single one of us. That there needed to be blood, sacrifice, that the holy standard of God created a wrath towards sin that he did not want to be expressed towards his creation. But he, for a season and a time, expressed it on sacrificial animals. That every morning and night, these animals would be sacrificed, blood would be shed, but it was all a type and a shadow of what Jesus would eventually do for us once and for all on the cross. It says he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for our sins, look at this, but also for the sins of the entire world. They've been paid for in advance. It's done. Now, this is, this is universal provision, not universal application. So this has been provided for for the whole world, yet it has not been applied to the whole world. You get that, you guys? Okay. Let me get theological with you, and then we'll get practical, right? Let's just dig into this. I want you to understand and glean from 1 John and kind of know your word and know the principles of your word a little bit more through this series, and then we're going to get really practical. There's three definitive works of the atonement to help you understand what this means, the atonement, the atoning sacrifice. There's three definitive works that God did, Jesus did, through the atonement. Three things. Write them down. Number one was the penalty of sin was removed. This is the atoning sacrifice. Like, hey, I was the one who sinned. I rebelled. I messed up. Yet God's judgment of that sin is not expressed on me, but was fully satisfied on the Lamb of God that was slain. The, the record that was against me, I accrued it. I accrued the record. I did that thing. It was canceled because of Christ. Look what it says in Colossians chapter 2, verse 14. He canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. Now this is, this is because of the atonement, that the penalty that was on us, he atoned for once and for all. Many followers of Jesus only live in that space of, oh yay, I'm forgiven. I'm free. I got no more penalty. It's on him. But we don't understand the completion of the promise of what Jesus did, the authority that's there. Because not only is it the penalty, the atonement takes care of the penalty, but number two, the atonement takes care of the power of sin. Like, you, you are not subject to, it has no authority or reign or dominion over you anymore because of the cross and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The, the Apostle Paul wrestled with this in his book to the, to the Romans in let me give you some homework. Let me give you a homework assignment, all right? Romans chapter 6 and 7. I want you to read Romans chapter 6 and 7, where the apostle Paul kind of plays on the tension of, of the grace of God that we have, that we're not under the law anymore. We're not under that legalistic system anymore, that we have the grace of God that was demonstrated in Jesus Christ. But then he's like, but what does that mean now? We don't have the penalty of sin. Does that mean live it up? Let's go. It's just So he plays on that tension. Let me show it to you in Romans chapter 6, verse 15. He says, what then? What do we do then with all this? Shall we sin because we're not under the law, but we're under grace? And he goes, no, that's not what it's for by no means. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves to the one you obey? Whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that though you used to be a slave to sin, you have come to obey not the rules, come to obey not the, command, not, not the regulations, you have come to obey from your heart. That God did something inside of your heart by the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. You have been set, see, keyword 
from sin. You are not free of sin. You are free from sin, meaning the shackles of sin have been broken off you in Jesus' name. The bondage of sin, that you were held in dominion captive to sin no more. It's not that we're free of sin, we're free from sin. And we become slaves to righteousness. This is Paul's language, slave to righteousness. John's language is walking in the light, that as I walk in the light, I can have power to have dominion over that which used to have dominion over me. There's power. Because of the atonement of Christ, uh, the penalty of sin is gone. The, The power of sin is now shifted. I have authority. I have dominion. As I walk in the light and walk in the spirit, I have power over sin. And not only that, this last one is called the presence of sin. That the atonement has taken care of the presence of sin. Now this one is future tense. This is not, this, this is the, the part of the atonement that is not now yet. One day when God comes back, when Jesus comes back and raptures his church and judges the living and the dead at the great right throne judgment seat of Christ, he will do away with sin once and for all. The presence of sin will be dealt with completely. Okay? So, so this is John's approach to sin and, how, and why he's needing to show the church because their casual compromising approach to the teachings of Jesus, the life that he wants us to live. So he's drawing a little bit of sin. And then he goes even further. He goes, okay. Then he shows us some tests to how you know. If you're, if you're a child of God, how you know if you're walking in the light. See, walking in the light is not only being honest with others, but it's also expressing obedience to God. Okay. So John's going to give us three tests of how you know. I put it down like this, like how do I walk in the light? So if that's, if you're here today and you want to walk in the light, there are three things that John says. If you're, if you're, if you got true saving faith, it looks like this. Number one is this. If I want to walk in the light, I, I got to grow to love God's commands. No, 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 not, not obey and do his commands. No, I got to grow to love his commands. See, before I met Jesus, and I surrender my life to him. I, anyone else had a problem making good choices? Anyone else in here still has a problem making good choices? Okay, like I did not make good choices with my life, you guys. I was a very selfish person, and, uh, and, and I mean, even like school, I approached it like, I didn't like to, I didn't like school, I didn't like homework, like reading. I don't, I, I don't think I ever read one book before I met Jesus. Not one book, you know, I, 20 years old is when I, it was the, the Bible was the very f- first book I read cover to cover. The very first, first book. Something happened, though, with, with who I used to be. The moment that this light was revealed and shined in my heart, God changed my heart and my mind that I no longer wanted to live my life to please myself and to do what I wanted. I wanted to obey God. I loved God's word. I loved God's commands that it wasn't like an effort, like I gotta obey. No, he did something inside of my heart and my mind that I love God's commands. The the apostle John, our spiritual father, is trying to show us what true saving faith looks like. And those who are truly his have had a heart transformation. That though you used to live to gratify yourself, those who are truly his Live to gratify him. First John chapter 2, let's look at it. First John chapter 2, verse 3. We know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar. I'm just going to let John preach this one, you guys. Okay? I'm not going to add too much of this. This is just, this is Papa John, right? Okay, guys, this ain't, okay. And the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys the word, love for God is truly made complete in him. And this is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. Yeah, this, isn't, this probably isn't one of those messages that you want to grow your church with. This is, this is a message that you want to grow your people. You know what I mean? And honestly, I'm not, trying to, I'm not trying to grow the church. I'm not. I'm trying to be faithful to the word that God has given us for the church. That's what I try to do. Faithful to... Which, by the way, last week, just so you know, last week we had a record-breaking attendance here at Discovery Church on a non-holiday, and we had over 100 people commit their life to Jesus. Isn't that awesome? 
And that is worth celebrating. That means a lot to us, but I want you to know something. Our goal, my goal, is not to grow the church. My goal is to be faithful to God. And as I'm faithful and I obey and I show you what God is showing me to show you, then I build, he's going to build his church. And he's going to build you. And this may not be a popular teaching. You must do as Jesus did. Now, it's not talking about you living exactly like him because he's the son of God, Emmanuel. You can't do that. But it's, the, it's how he lived. And how he lived was this. He told us how he lived. Remember, he said, I only do that which, with, which the Father has done. I only say that which we, the Father has, has said. The, Jesus lived. He, here was the secret, you guys. He walked in total, unrelenting, unbroken fellowship and dependence on the activity of the Father living in him. And this is what it means to walk in the light, to walk in the spirit, to be a slave of righteousness, is to, to allow God to sow into us, not trying harder, but it's yielding to the work of the Holy Spirit progressively as I walk by faith. John 14 and 15, Jesus says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Now, I want you to understand this truth, especially in the light of this message today. Do not interpret this message. Don't interpret this scripture in, in like, oh, I better start obeying. Let me start obeying because I want to prove I love God. That is the wrong way to take this teaching and to take John, his message. Here's what Jesus is saying. If you love me, I'll do such a work inside of you that you would, you'll be changed from the inside out. Your heart will shift, your mind will shift, that if you love me, the result will be you'll walk in the light. You'll be a slave to righteousness instead of a slave to sin. If you love me, you'll want to obey. You'll want to. You'll love my commands. So, so how do we walk in the light? i got to learn then how to love God's commands. The second way he tells us to walk in the light is I got to learn how to love God's family. It's just easier to just love God, just walk in God's commands. Show me the commandments, God, because huh? these people are difficult. You know what I mean? Just give me the list of the things that I'm supposed to obey. Let me just obey that stuff because this is a lot harder for us, for a lot of you, loving God's family. But those who walk in the light are marked by love. And this love is revealed, or to borrow John's word, manifested in our obedience to God, and in loving others. Some of you need to stop lying to yourself and pretending that you can actually have a relationship with God and turn your back on your brothers. You need to stop, stop living the lie, man, that Christianity and faith is just between you and God, and you can walk in offense and bitterness, that you cannot have true, authentic relationships marked by the love of Christ. You can't. John says, this is a test of how you know those who are his and not. Not only do you love God's commands, but you actually love God's people. Let's look at it. Continue 1 John chapter 2, verse 9. Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates his brother or sister is actually still in darkness. If we're claiming one thing. We're going to church. We're doing some, some, some things. But in my relationships, it's not transferring over. Anyone who loves their brother and sister lives in the light, and there is, look what he says, nothing in them to make them stumble. That if I walk in this authentic love for my brother and my sister, that it protects me from stumbling through my faith in this journey of life. Of verse 11, but anyone who hates his brother or sister is in the darkness. And walks around in darkness. They don't know where they're going because the darkness has blinded them, meaning they're stumbling all over the place. In and out of church, faith up and down, hot and cold, roller coaster kind of experience to which, listen to me, please listen, listen. Some of you in your faith journey, that's kind of been the, the rhythm. It's been in, out, up, down, hot, cold. And for some of you, you've misdiagnosed it. It's actually not about your faith. It's not about your relationship with God, your love for God. Oh, I just need to obey more. Actually, what John is saying here is you up and down, in and out, stumbling around through your life might not be about you and God. It might be the way you're treating people. It might be that 
you don't have any authentic relationships, brothers and sisters. It might be that you keep letting offense in and bitterness in and unforgiveness in, which is a part of darkness and does not dwell in light. First John chapter 3, 14. I know I'm getting ahead, but I'm going to pull in this next chapter verse real quick because it applies here. We know that we have passed from death to life because I love of God. I'm devoted to God. I know my Bible. I speak in tongues. I got the gift of healing. I got the gift of prophecy. Man, I'm anointed. No. We know that we pass from death to life because we love each other. Anyone who does not love then remains in death. This is, again, John... He's just, he's helping us because there's a lot of confusion in the body of Christ in his time and still today. This is how you know. Love God's family. Love for God's commands. Jesus said in John 13, 35, by this everyone will know you're my disciples. If you love one another. This is the marker of a true follower of Jesus. Love. Love for God that expresses it in obedience and love for others. And then lastly, he says, if you want to walk in the light, do this third thing, write it down this way. You got to adopt a biblical worldview. A biblical worldview. What do I mean by that? He starts to contrast. Remember, John loves contrast. Light, darkness, love, hate. He starts to contrast the word of God with the world. So you are going to live your life here on earth, your just daily routines and everything, you're going to live your life from the perspective of the Word of God, or are you going to live your life from the perspective of the world you're living in? Okay, here's what he says. First John chapter 2 continues, verse 15. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, then the love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, comes not from the Father, but from the world. So it does not come from heaven. It's not part of the kingdom. It's part of a different system. It's not part of light. It's part of darkness. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever, he says. Now, the important distinction here when he's talking about world, he's talking about the world system. Not the world as in the people, because God so loved the world, right? He's talking about the world system of which the enemy is at the helm of the world system that you and I are living in and breathing in and walking in and working in. Look at what it says in Ephesians chapter 2. He says, once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins, you used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying who? Wait a second. I'm no devil worshiper here. I never obeyed no devil. No, here's what he's saying. Because you were operating Living from the perspective of the world system, which you didn't realize, is the devil is the author of the world system. So you're either, this is why John is saying, you're either walking in light or you're walking in darkness. There's no gray here in this world, okay? This, you're, you're, he says, you're obeying, the, he calls him the commander of the powers of the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. Are we going to live by the, the perspective of God's word or the world around us? 1 John chapter 3, verse 10, he says, In this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. How are you going to live your life? In our world, it's easy. It's easy to just come into church and check in and check out or maybe use my teachings as a little bit of self-help motivation or some teachings of whoever you watch or books that you read. But what does true saving faith look like? And I'm not up here to judge that for you. I'm here to just expose you, reveal to you the Word of God and allow God's Word to do whatever it is doing in your heart right now. I'm not pointing any finger, I'm just bringing you the word. What are we living by? 
What does true saving faith look like, God? Well, it looks like true love for His commands, loving others and living our life based on His Word instead of this world. Let me conclude with, with the Gospel of John, chapter 3. It's not in your notes. I put it up here on the screen on purpose just so that you can receive this part. I just want you to receive this. I don't want you to like read in your notes or anything. Just receive what he says. A lot of us know John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. But the context of what he's saying here I think is, is powerful, especially concerning what we're talking about today. John chapter 3, verse 19 says, this is the verdict. I love this language that John gives. He says, it's a verdict. This is the truth. The one who is true and just says what it is. I mean, you can make a defense, you can make an argument, whatever you want, but this is the one who is true says this is it. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. And we see it. We see his light. We see the love. We see the draw. But the reality is we want to hold on to our dark. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that our deeds would be exposed. But if I were to step out of this darkness, man, I'll be seen. Under this mask, it don't look good. I'm, I'm afraid of what he'll do. I'm afraid of what they'll, what they'll say. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. I can't hide it. I'm not going to hide it anymore. I'm just going to step into this light. Now verse 16, look what it says. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. You may be here today and you may recognize that one of your approaches to sin the struggles, the strongholds that you have in your life was just to stay in darkness. Leave good enough alone. And maybe stepping into the light is pretty scary to you. But what the enemy has been lying to you is that you're not going to receive what you thought, what you're afraid of receiving. What he actually has for you is freedom. It's grace. It's power love. When you step out of the darkness and into his marvelous light. Hey, thank you for watching the Discovery Church YouTube channel. Don't stop here. Join the Discovery Online family every Sunday. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream event and share it with a friend. You can also support the ministry by clicking the give button to help us continue to reach people around the world for Jesus Christ. Thank you again for watching. Go love God, love each other, and change the world.